welcome. Uh, welcome to the first virtual Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum speaker series. Here we'll have paleontology guests uh, call in for a presentation on science, fossils, and dinosaurs, and where the public will be able to ask questions both here at the museum and live on YouTube. For the viewers at home, you can leave your questions in the comment section, and I will read them to Dr. Fan at the end. There we go. Sorry about that overlap. All right. First off, we want to acknowledge that we are on the homeland of the many diverse First Nations and Métis people whose ancestors have walked this land since time immemorial. We are grateful to work, live, and learn on the traditional territory of Treaty 8. Today, Dr. Emily Bansworth will be presenting Canada Rocks, Canada's 10 Greatest Paleontological and Geological Treasures. Dr. Bamforth has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Alberta in Evolutionary Biology, a Master of Science from Queen's University, and a PhD from McGill University, where she studied pre-extinction paleoecology in Saskatchewan. She started to work in 2014 at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum T-Rex Discovery, Discovery Center in East End, Saskatchewan. She has also been awarded the 2019 Women of Distinction Award for Science from Saskatchewan at YW. CA. Thank you, Dr. Bamforth, for joining us virtually today. And with that, I will hand the floor to you. Great. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is the first time I've done this kind of like platform presentation. So hopefully all goes according to plan. Uh, we're doing all kinds of new and exciting things in these strange days. Um, so to get started here, I just want to start off with a slide that's probably familiar with a, to a lot of you. Um, this is what driving through Canada looks like, a lot of Canada. Uh, this is the Trans-Canada Highway as it goes through the roughly 40 billion kilometers worth of Northern Ontario. Um, but it also looks like Canada when you drive west to BC. Um, it sort of shows you the three things that Canada has in most abundance. That is rocks, trees, and water. So Canada is home to less than 0.5% of the world's human population, but it has 10% of the world's forested land and 20% or one fifth of the world's freshwater resources. Canada is also the second largest country in the world, which means that it has a lot of land. And underneath all of that land, there's a lot of rock. So Canada has vast expanses of rock that cover vast periods of geologic time. That makes it a really great place to be a paleontologist or a geologist. So today I just wanna go over actually 12. Um, I, had to, I added two more because I thought they were really cool. 12 of the coolest rock related features and facts from Canada. Um, and to really show you why Canada really rocks. But to get started here, um, just to make sure that everyone is paying attention, we'll start with a little pop quiz here. Um, so this, of course, is Queen Elizabeth II, um, and whether or not she planned it, that day her outfit perfectly camouflaged against the building stone behind her. Now this building stone is a very famous Canadian building stone. Um, it's found in buildings across the country, including almost all of the legislative buildings. So even though you don't, may not know the name, um, you have probably seen this somewhere. So this rock is called Tyndall stone or Tyndall limestone. It's mined in uh, Manitoba from what's called the Tyndall formation. And as I mentioned, Tyndall stone is a limestone and limestones form in reef environments. So they often have fossils in them. And Tyndall stone is absolutely famous for being chock-a-block full of fossils. So these are examples of some of the fossils we can find in these rocks. This is a, a little snail. That's kind of like a squid-like animal. These are both corals. So anytime you're around in, in, a, in a city, in an airport, um, and you see this kind of rock, I would encourage you to go up and take a really close look because there's some amazing fossils in this rock. Um, and again, it's a very famous Canadian building stone from Manitoba. So let's get into our 10 coolest rocks. So number one, did you know that Canada has the oldest rocks on Earth? So these come from a place in northern northern Quebec. This is actually an Inuit word. 
Um, and these rocks date to an incredible 4.3 billion years old. Now consider that Earth itself is 4.6 billion years old. These rocks formed 300 million years after basically Earth became a solid ball. Um, so these are extremely old rocks. And again, they're found right here in Canada. So number two, this is a place that may be familiar to some of you. This is what's called the Big Rock of Okotoks. So Okotoks is a, a large town or a small city south of Calgary. Um, and its name actually derives from the Blackfoot word meaning rock. And it's a reference to this particular feature. This rock is what's called a glacial erratic. So glacial erratics were rocks that were carried by glaciers and then dumped when the glaciers melted, often in the middle of the prairies. So they're very, they're very easy to see. The, the, the Okotoks erratic is actually a chunk of the Rocky Mountains that basically got torn off and basically hitched a lift about a hundred, more than, well, several hundred kilometers from um, the Rocky Mountains to where it was dropped by Okotoks. And this is actually the world's largest glacial erratic. It's thought to weigh about 16,500 tons. So it is the world's largest glacial erratic found right here in Canada. So number three, this is one of our very famous fossil sites. And you'll notice down in the corner here, this particular symbol, this is the symbol of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So um, some of these fossil sites are so important, they have been internationally recognized of places of importance. And this is one of them, the Burgess Shale. So the Burgess Shale is found in the Rocky Mountains in Yoho National Park in British Columbia. And it contains fossils of some of the world's oldest animals. So these animals are very bizarre looking. If you look hard enough, you can kind of see that they're a little like animals today. So things like, like arthropods, like insects and crustaceans and mollusks. Um, but a lot of them are very bizarre. This one here is called Anomalocaris. This is Herdia canadensis. This one is actually called Hallucigenia because it looks so weird. Um, but the amazing thing about the Burgess Shale is that these fossils are incredibly well preserved. So we can get a lot of information about the origin and the evolution of animals from this one site. So Burgess Shale is actually home to my very favorite fossil of all time. This is a critter called Opabinia. Um, and it's got a lot of weird things going on. It had five eyes on its head. It had these flukes along its side that it used for swimming. And then underneath the flukes, it had an appendage that was both a leg and a gill. And then it had this really long hose-like appendage that came out the front with a set of clippers at the end. So it's basically a particular vicious looking swimming vacuum cleaner. Um, but this is one of the amazing fossils from the Burgess Shale. So the Burgess Shale is old. It's about 452 million years old. But Canada actually has a very famous fossil site that's even older. Um, and this is a place called Mistaken Point in Newfoundland, and it is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is a site that has some of the oldest multicellular organisms in history. So if you think for about 4 billion years of Earth's history, everything was unicellular. And then there was a, a relatively sudden change where things started to become multicellular, basically when life got big. And Mistaken Point is one of those places that captures that transition. So this is a place that's near and dear to my heart. This is where I did my master's thesis research. So you can see it's basically on the Eastern end of what's called the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland. Um, and it's close to a very famous lighthouse called Cape Race. This was the lighthouse that the Titanic sent its SOS signal to. So this is what the surface at Mistaken Point looks like. And you kind of have to get your eye in there. You can see these are the impressions of the fossils on the surface here. And uh, it's a neat site. The, the pinkish stuff is mudstone. The grayish stuff is volcanic ash. So these were ancient paleo communities that were living on the seafloor and basically got covered with volcanic ash. So this is from a time period called the Ediacaran or the Precambrian. So this is sometimes called the Precambrian Pompeii. And the, the, the organisms that lived here were very bizarre. That's kind of an example of one of them. Um, this is not a plant. This is not a coral. It's not an animal. It's not a bacteria. It's not a fungus. It is something 
that is completely gone. There is nothing like this that is left on Earth today. So this was kind of a failed experiment um, in the history of multicellular life. Um, and this is one of the best places in the world to study this time period is in Newfoundland. So number five, this is kind of a cool one. Um, if you look at a map of Canada and you kind of zoom in on Quebec and you kind of look to the middle and to the, the right, you'll see what looks like a bullseye. You can actually see it on most maps. This is an impact crater, a bolide impact crater. So this was a meteor that hit the planet um, sometime during the Triassic period, about 230 million years ago. Um, and it's pretty big. It's 70 kilometers across. And it's not the biggest impact crater in the world. There's actually four that are slightly larger. Um, but all of those ones are in what's called the subsurface. They've sort of been buried over, so you can't see them with the naked eye. This one you can. And this is the world's largest um, visible impact crater. Um, and it's found, it's called the Manicougan Crater. And again, that is from, from Eastern Quebec. So that's kind of cool. So a lot of my, the features that I chose were paleontologically orientated. I'm a little bit biased that way, but I thought if there was any mineral people out there, I better throw in a mineral. Um, so this is the mineral um, potash. So potash is the common name for a mineral called sylvite. Um, and this formed about back in the Devonian period, about 350 million years ago, when all of North America was covered by a sea. And the part that is now Saskatchewan got restricted. It basically became a lagoon and it became hypersaline, but so, so, so salty that nothing lived in it. However, 350 million years later, we have this great salt deposit of sylvite and it is rich in potassium. Um, and it's a very important component of a lot of commercial fertilizers. Um, so Canada, in particular Saskatchewan, is the world's largest exporter of potash, um, producing about 11 million tons a year. Um, so if you're ever through Saskatchewan, there's actually potash mines right on the side of the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, so if you, if you get bored of looking at grain, you can look for potash mines. So number seven, this is another famous Canadian fossil locality, another UNESCO World Heritage Site. These are the fossil cliffs at a place called Joggins, Nova Scotia. So if you look really carefully at this surface, you can see that it's covered with what looks like ripples. Um, so some of those are ripples, but some of those are also footprints. So these are footprints of some of the very earliest animals that came out of the water to live permanently on land. They're what we call amniotes. So amniotes are animals that can lay their eggs on land. Um, so reptiles, mammals, and birds. So this was kind of the origin of that. This is Carboniferous in age. So this is pre-dinosaurs. Um, this particular site is really famous for this fossil, which is called Hylanomus lilai. Hylanomus means tree dweller. And the reason it's called that is because at Joggins, you can actually find the fossils of trees preserved upright in the rock, which is really incredible. And these trees are called lycopods and they became hollow when they died. And these little like lizard-like things would crawl inside them. Um, and so the world's oldest amniote, that's Hylanomus lila is considered the oldest, was found inside a fossilized tree stump standing vertically uh, inside this amazing fossil locality in Nova Scotia. So this is a really great place to visit if you ever have a chance. So number eight, um, I'm currently in a dinosaur museum. Those of you at the Philip J. Curry Museum are in a dinosaur museum. So let's talk a little bit about dinosaurs. Um, so this is a site that's probably familiar to a lot of people. This is Dinosaur Provincial Park. And it is absolutely world famous as a Cretaceous dinosaur site. It has more than 40 species of dinosaur that are found there. Um, so by comparison here in Saskatchewan, we only find 14 and that's considered a lot. Um, so it's the only place in the world that comes close to having the diversity of dinosaurs. Um, so the only place in the, the only other place in the world that has this diversity of dinosaurs is the Gobi Desert. Um, so it's internationally recognized as a place to come and study dinosaurs. Um, and every year there are many, many international paleontologists that come to 
um, excavate dinosaurs from this area of Alberta. Um, so really a phenomenal place if you ever get a chance to visit it. So while we're talking about dinosaurs, I want to tell you a little bit about what drew me to Saskatchewan. It has to do with dinosaurs, but it actually is their extinction. Um, so this here, this layer right in here, is what is called the KPG boundary. So that name takes a little bit of unpacking. The K stands for Cretaceous. Yes, Cretaceous stands with, starts with a C, but C was already short for Carboniferous, so they had to choose a different letter, so they chose a K. And the PG stands for Paleogene, which is the time period immediately after the dinosaurs go, extinction, go extinct. The Paleogene used to be called the Tertiary, so you may also hear this referred to as the KT boundary. Um, and this is the extinction layer of the dinosaurs. It's the only mass extinction in Earth's history where you can actually put your finger on the point where it happened. Um, and there are a handful of places in Alberta you can see it, but the most extensive exposures of it are actually in Saskatchewan, in southern Saskatchewan. Um, so this is kind of a close up of what it looks like. So here in Saskatchewan, the rocks below the boundary, we call them the Frenchman Formation. In Alberta, it's called the Lower Scholar Formation, but it's the same rock. And above that um, is what we call the Frenchman for, or the Raven's Crag Formation. In Saskatchewan and Alberta, it's called the Upper Scholar. Below that boundary, there's no dinosaurs. Sorry, below that boundary, there are dinosaurs. And above it, there's no dinosaurs. And between it, you get this line of kind of pinkish clay. That's thought to be fallout from the bolide impact. So when the, the meteor hit the planet in the Gulf of Mexico, threw up all kinds of debris, and then that debris slowly rained down um, to make this particular boundary. Um, and that layer is full of iridium, which is an extraterrestrial mineral, which is how we know it's associated with the, um, the meteor, the bolide impact. Um, so that is a really, really cool feature that we find here in Canada. And again, some of the best exposures of the KPG boundary um, in the world are found right here in Saskatchewan. So that's kind of cool. Um, so number 10 is another fairly famous, this is a famous Canadian heritage story um, that has to do with the Klondike gold fields, which are up in the Yukon. So this is a picture of the town of Dawson, which is found at the confluence of the Klondike and the, and the Yukon rivers. Um, Dawson is also known as the city of gold. Um, and this is sitting on a huge gold deposit. So if you were to, if you were to look, um, if you go to say Google Earth and you look for Dawson, what you will see from space is this kind of thing. And you see there's all of these like weird serpentine ridges along here. Um, it kind of looks like leaf mining is what it reminds me of. Um, these are mine tailings from something called placer mining. That's basically gold panning on an industrial scale. Um, so gold extraction definitely still happens in this region today. Um, and uh, a lot of it happens around this particular town of Dawson. So Dawson, of course, is, is famous for the Klondike gold rush. Um, so this is considered to be the last great gold rush. And it happened in that Dawson area that's also called the Klondike uh, between 1897 and 1899. And hundreds of thousands of people from all over North America um, went to Dawson, tried to get to the Klondike um, to find their fortune in these gold fields. Um, and if they were lucky, they were rich enough to be able to pay for a paddle steamer so they could get on a boat and go up the river. But if they weren't, they had to hike in from Alaska over what's called the Chilkoot Pass. And that's what you see here. This is a line of people that are slogging up this really steep pass to try and get to the Klondike. And to zoom in there, you can just see that these people are carrying probably everything they own. They basically dropped everything um, and they were going to find their fortune in the Klondike. Um, and this is a picture of Dawson City taken at the height of the, the, the Klondike Gold Rush. And Dawson City was actually the largest city north of Seattle at that time. It was bigger than Vancouver. It was bigger than Victoria. It had about 100,000 people living in it. Um, by comparison, the town of Dawson has, today has a, a kind of a resident population of about 600. 
Um, so it was different times. And this is definitely a very, very important part of Canadian history. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Dawson, it is a fantastic place to visit. Um, it's partially owned by Parks Canada who have kept up some of the old um, historical buildings. There's so many stories. It's the home of Robert Service and Jack London and Paul Burton. And there's some great First Nations history. It's just an amazing place if you ever get a chance to visit. So number 11, um, this is a great Canadian gemstone. And it's actually the provincial gemstone of Alberta. So you may recognize it. And this actually is not a stone at all. This is a fossil that is called amylite. Um, and amylite is, it's semi-precious and it is, it comes from the fossilized aragonite shells of animals called ammonites. So if you can imagine a squid with a coiled shell, um, that's what an ammonite was. And when they fossilized, their shells took on this beautiful opaline, um, shiny nacre uh, that, is, that is now mined as a gemstone. Um, and the Corite Ammonite Mine near Lethbridge um, is one of the only commercial fossil companies in Canada, and they mine uh, amylite to make into jewelry. Uh, so that is a, that's a really cool kind of great Canadian gemstone story. And finally, number 12, and I had to put this in, I'm a little bit biased, but as of March, 2019, the world's largest T-Rex, ladies and gentlemen, is officially Canadian. Um, so the T-Rex in question is one called Scotty. Uh, this is the T-Rex that was actually found right here near East End, Saskatchewan. Um, it was actually discovered in 1991. Um, but there was a paper that came out last year that officially described it as the world's largest T-Rex. It, it edged out a T-Rex from North Dakota called Sioux, and there was a huge blow up over that. Um, but now it's official. Um, Canada does have the world's largest T-Rex. Um, and Scotty has got a great story all to herself. And uh, if I'm ever invited back, I make it a chance to, to tell you about it. Or you can visit the T-Rex Discovery Center in East End. Um, not this year, unfortunately, we weren't able to open because of COVID, but next year for sure. Um, and there is also a Mount of Scotty at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum in Regina, if you get a chance to. Um, so that is another reason um, to be proud to be Canadian, is we have the world's largest T-Rex. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed kind of this brief sort of fun overview of some of the coolest fossils in Canada. Um, I actually do this presentation every year as a part of a Canada Day celebration um, at the T-Rex Center. So every year I go out and try and find more cool rocks. Um, and there are so many, so many cool ones that I haven't found or discussed yet. So keep your eyes open because you never know what you'll find. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Pepworth. Uh, we're now going to move to our question period. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, we've got one online question from Derek Larson. Uh, he would like to know, have you done field work at the Mistaken Point and how does working there differ from your field work in Saskatchewan? So that's a good question. Um, I did do field work in Mistaken Point. That's with those those really old multicellular, some of the first multicellular organisms. And it's very different because at mistaken point, you're looking at impressions in rock. Um, and it's also a protected area. So we're not allowed to actually collect the rock. Um, so what we do is we make what are called latex peels. We kind of make a copy of the surface. Um, and that way we can take that copy back to the university to study. Um, what we do here in Saskatchewan is much more classical um, pickaxe and shovel digging up dinosaurs kind of thing. Um, it's, they're also very different, different organisms. Um, the mistaken point is about half a billion years old. Most of the fossils we get here in Saskatchewan are between 72 and 65 million. Um, so there's about half a million years, half a billion years worth of difference in time there. So it's, um, it was great to have like both experiences because they're very different. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we've got a second online question. How close do dinosaur fossils that have been found so far in the Saskatchewan uh, get to the KPG boundary? So that's oh, a good, oh, sorry. Go 
So that's a good question. Um, kind of how close is the, the closest dinosaur fossil to the KPG boundary? Um, we found dinosaur fossils um, within two meters of the boundary and we found other fossils um, from other animals um, kind of within 20 centimeters of the boundary. Um, and above the boundary, um, we have found mammal fossils like centimeters above it. Um, so they get, they get really close on both sides. Thank you so much. I'm just going to get to check and see if there's any questions from the restaurant. Mm -hmm. oh, we've got another one here from Caleb W. Uh, can you give some background as to how the four billion plus year old rock formation in Quebec would have survived recycling via plate tectonics? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, and the reason is because kind of the central part of Canada is what's called a craton, um, which means that it's actually never been close enough to the edges to actually have ever been subducted. Um, so the rock has been basically terrestrial ever since it formed. Um, and there are a few of those really ancient cratons in the world. Um, Australia is another one. Um, so there's parts of Australia that have never been subducted. Um, and that just as basically has to do with kind of the buoyancy of the terrestrial crust versus the marine crust. Um, and uh, so there, there are parts of the world that have actually never, or terrestrial parts that have actually never been subducted and recycled like that. Um, there's not many, very many, but they're, they are out there. So that, that's a good question. I hope that kind of answers what you're asking. Um, do we have any other questions? I think that's it for now. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. And no yeah, it was a fantastic talk. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for staying. Thanks for listening. Oh, I've got one more question here. Okay. I have a question from Cam R. What's your most favorite field site that you've ever worked? Oh, that is such a hard question. Um, I think I am particularly partial to um, Grasslands National Park in southern Saskatchewan. Um, it's got some amazing exposures of the KPG boundary, um, and it's just such an incredibly beautiful place to work. Um, it's a dark sky preserve. It's, it's an audio preserve. So there's not a lot of um, like man-made sound. It's just such a dynamic, incredible landscape. Um, so I, I definitely say Grasslands National Park is, is, is one of my favorites, but, uh, but it's a tough call because there's a lot of them. Fantastic. All right, I think that is the end of our question period. Great. Well, thanks again. All right, thanks so much. Take care.